In a previous video, we talked about how sound is a change in air pressure over time. That change in air pressure is caused by something moving back and forth that causes the air particles to be compressed and rarefied or squeezed together and pulled apart, and they in turn push and pull on your eardrum. What we're looking at here is a piston, which is a simplified representation of a loudspeaker driver, like a tweeter or a woofer, moving in and out of an infinitely large box. This causes a sound wave to radiate away from it. For most of the rest of this video, I'll just call it a loudspeaker to keep things simple. The speed at which the wave moves is the speed of sound. It's important to remember that this is not the same as the speed at which the air particles themselves are moving. The musical note, or the pitch that we hear, is determined by how frequently the loudspeaker repeats its cycle of movement. In other words, how many times it goes back and forth each second. And the length of the wave in air, the wavelength, is a result of the relationship between those two things. Since the speed of sound stays more or less constant, then the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength, because we have to fit more waves into the same distance in the air. In this video, we'll look at what happens when you have more than one sound source, more than one loudspeaker, and they're somehow related to each other. If we stop time and look at the wave that's radiating outwards from the loudspeaker, we can see that it's radiating equally in all directions. So it's just as loud here, in front of the loudspeaker, as it is here, off to the side. This is an important thing to remember for a good part of this video. Let's now change to two loudspeakers instead, but both of them are synchronized so that they're moving the same amount at the same time. What happens now? As we can see, the two work together so that they push or pull at the same time. So this means that when you're far away from them, we get roughly the same behavior as we had with just one loudspeaker. The sound radiates more or less equally in all directions. However, this is because I'm using a low frequency that produces a long wavelength. In fact, if you look carefully at the wavelength in the air particles on the screen at the moment, then you'll see that it's four times the distance between the two loudspeakers. So what happens when I raise the frequency and therefore make the wavelength smaller like this? As you can see now, things are different. For positions that are the same distance from both loudspeakers, on a horizontal line halfway up your screen, things are the same. We still have compression and refraction, and so if you were sitting there, you'd hear sound. However, if you look here, you can see that the air particles aren't moving much at all. So if you were sitting in that area, you wouldn't hear anything at this frequency. Why does this happen? Well, let's look back at the front. If we measure a distance from the bottom loudspeaker to a place where the air is compressed, and then we draw a circle with that radius centered around the bottom loudspeaker, it'll look like this black line. If we do the same thing with the upper loudspeaker, it looks like this red line. If we're the same distance from both loudspeakers, then those two circles overlap, and so that means their two compression waves overlap. So at this position, the air particles, and therefore your eardrum, are getting pushed by both loudspeakers at the same time, and so they're pushed together. The same is true if we look at the rarefaction wave, shown in blue for the bottom loudspeaker and in green for the top loudspeaker. So here we can see the place where both loudspeakers are pulling the air particles apart at the same time, and therefore pulling your eardrum out of your head. So if you're sitting at a position that's the same distance from both loudspeakers, you're in a place where either their compression waves overlap and work together, or their refraction waves overlap and work together. This means that you get compression and refraction of the air particles, and therefore, if you're in that place, there's sound for you to hear. However, let's look at that compression wave from the bottom loudspeaker again. If we're sitting in a location that's a little closer to the top loudspeaker up here, then we'll be in a position where you get the compression wave of the bottom loudspeaker, shown in black, at the same time as you get the rarefaction wave from the top loudspeaker, shown in green. This is because the top loudspeaker is closer, so its signal arrives a little bit earlier than the one from the bottom loudspeaker. The difference in distances 
from this position to the two loudspeakers happens to be exactly the same as half a wavelength. The result of this is that, at this location, the top loudspeaker is pulling the air particles while the bottom one is pushing them, and a pull and a push equal nothing because they cancel each other out. Again, it's important to remember here that you aren't experiencing two different signals that negate each other in your brain. You don't, you don't hear two different sounds that suddenly you magically can't hear. The two signals are actually working against each other to stop the movement of the air particles. So there's no sound in that location to be able to be heard. Now let's keep the frequency the same, but we'll change the relative behavior of the two loudspeakers. Let's make them work opposite each other, so when one pushes, the other pulls. Now we can see that pattern of loud areas and quiet areas have swapped places. So the silent zone is now on a horizontal line across the middle of the screen. This is where the two loudspeakers work against each other and cancel each other's effect. However, if we look up here, we can see that we do get sound because the push from the top loudspeaker meets the previous push that happened half a cycle ago from the bottom loudspeaker, and those two pushes add together constructively to make sound. Let's synchronize the loudspeakers again and watch what happens when we increase the frequency some more. Now we can see that we still get areas where there is sound and areas where there's no sound, but the pattern is different. And as we increase the frequency, and therefore reduce the wavelength, this pattern will not only change, but it will get more and more complex. Now let's see what happens when we add another loudspeaker. We'll put in a third one between the first two. To begin, we'll synchronize all three loudspeakers so they move together. At a low frequency, the effect is the same as it was with one or two loudspeakers and a low frequency. In fact, we can even be more specific and say that once the frequency is low enough so that the wavelength is bigger than the distance between the two most distant loudspeakers, in this case the top and the bottom ones, then we'll see roughly the same behavior. The bigger the wavelength, the more similar they become. However, at a high frequency, where the wavelength is smaller than the distance between the outside loudspeakers, things get increasingly complicated depending on the number of loudspeakers we're using, their specific synchronization, and how much they're moving in and out. Let's look at some more examples. This is three loudspeakers, where the middle one is moving opposite to the two outside ones, but at a low frequency. This is the same, but at a higher frequency where the wavelength in air is the same as the distance between the two outside loudspeakers. This is five loudspeakers where they're all in sync at a low frequency. Notice that the wavefront goes in all directions because of the long wavelength relative to the distance between the outside loudspeakers again. This is the same, but at a higher frequency. Now the wavelength is the same as the distance between the two outside loudspeakers. This is five loudspeakers again, but I've changed the relationship of their synchronization. So now they're moving so that the middle one leads and the outer ones follow in turn. Notice that at this particular frequency, it results in a wave that's louder to the side of the array than directly in front. You can see this because the line formed by the compression of the air particles is slightly darker there. This is five loudspeakers again, but now I've synchronized them to move in a wave pattern. Notice that this causes the sound wave to change direction downwards, which is actually to the side of the loudspeaker array. If we take this to an extreme case, we could say that a real loudspeaker driver, like a tweeter or a woofer, is basically the same as this, but using a lot more pistons, where each piston represents a molecule on the surface of the loudspeaker driver. So basically a driver is just a lot of pistons, all working together to push and pull the air particles in front of it. This raises the question, does a real loudspeaker behave the same way? The quick answer to this question is sort of, but let's do a little experiment to see the effect. I took a small two inch driver and mounted it in a tray and then I filled the tray with water. So what we're looking at here is the driver half submerged in water. I can move the driver with an audio signal and see what happens on the surface of the water. 
Here we're looking at a really low frequency. As you can probably see, the wave moves outwards in all directions because the wavelength on the surface of the water is bigger than the diameter of the loudspeaker. But we have to remember here that what we're looking at is the wavelength on the surface of the water, which is different than the wavelength in air, because the speed of the wave on the surface of the water is different than the speed of sound in air. If I increase the frequency one octave, so I'm multiplying the frequency by two, then we can see that things are still pretty well behaving, meaning that the sound is still going in all directions. However, if I increase the frequency another octave, so I've multiplied by two again, we can see things starting to misbehave. You can see places where the waves are higher than they are in other areas. And as I increase the frequency more and more, the pattern of radiation, in other words, the pattern that's formed by the places where the water is moving up and down a lot and the places where it's not moving at all, that pattern becomes more and more chaotic, with the high and low sound pressure areas becoming closer and closer together. So, in essence, we can say that a loudspeaker behaves the same way as a big collection of very tiny loudspeakers, all placed side by side. Ultimately, and this is speaking really generally, the effect is that when the wavelength of the sound in air is bigger than the diameter of the loudspeaker driver, then the sound goes in all directions. However, if the wavelength is smaller than the loudspeaker's diameter, then things start to misbehave, and the higher we go in frequency, the more they misbehave. Also, if you've really been paying attention to what you've seen on the screen, you've probably noticed that everything I've said only applies to areas that are far away from the loudspeaker. If you're very close to it, then things are a lot more complicated, but for the purposes of this video, we'll just pretend that that didn't happen.